Biology is the scientific study of life, and all the organisms on this slide, as well as you, the student watching this presentation, are alive. But what is life? Life forms display a wide variety of characteristics, but they all share several important ones. Seems easy to tell the difference between living and non-living. Take a butterfly and a rock. But certain properties help us scientifically distinguish between what is alive, or biological, and what isn't. So all life has some kind of order. We can see order in the social hierarchy of chimpanzees or the arrangement of reproductive structures on this flower. But at an even smaller level, all life is composed of units called cells. The cell is the basic unit of life, and all things that are alive are composed of cells, sometimes just one, sometimes millions or more. Organization below this level, for example the molecules that make up cells, do not display all the characteristics or provide the necessary functions to be considered alive. You started off as a single egg. Did you know that? Fertilized eggs, or zygotes, divide and develop into the mature organism. This illustrates a concept in biology we call cell theory. This theory states that all life is composed of cells and that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. An organism may be unicellular or have one cell, such as this paramecium, or an organism may be multicellular and have many cells, like the anteater. In unicellular life, all processes occur within a single cell. It has structures to metabolize food, to excrete waste, to move, etc. Multicellular organisms have differentiated cells to perform these functions, such as a digestive system or an excretory system. Every cell displays a high level of organization. A membrane separates the contents of the cell from the external environment, and the cell contains structures, such as ribosomes, that enable it to perform all activities required for life. Its genetic instructions are coded in DNA, which is found within a specific region of the cell. Now, not all cells are alike. We can see the most obvious differences in the two main types of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. See the three cells? Those line the insides of your cheek and are examples of eukaryotic cells. The cells are stained so that certain structures are easy to see, such as the nucleus. Eukaryotic cells have nuclei, in which the DNA is enclosed in a protective membrane, those purple circles in the middle of the cells. The small, rod-shaped cells on the eukaryotic cells are bacteria. See them? Those are examples of prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are relatively small and simple compared to eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic DNA is found within a specific region of the cell, called the nucleoid. Life must make copies of itself. If a life form does not reproduce, its genetic heritage does not pass to the next generation. In other words, when it dies, there is no more life. Reproduction is our next property of life. I know you want to hear all about sex, but not all forms of reproduction include sex. Hmm, bummer, I know. In asexual reproduction, just one lonely individual gives rise to two or more offspring that are similar to the parent. This kind of reproduction is commonly seen in unicellular organisms, like this budding yeast cell. Prokaryotes undergo asexual reproduction, as do some eukaryotics like yeast. There is a fascinating phenomenon called parthenogenesis, in which some eukaryotic multicellular organisms make clones of themselves. Many rotifers, tiny animals that live in freshwater or saltwater habitats, can reproduce this way. In fact, some rotifer species lack males altogether and are believed to only reproduce by parthenogenesis. A handful of more advanced animals can undergo parthenogenesis, like whiptail lizards and bonnethead sharks, but most eukaryotes rely on sexual reproduction to produce offspring. It's time for the exciting kind of reproduction. In sexual reproduction, two parents contribute genetic information in the form of gametes, or sex cells. These happy flies are mating so their gametes can get together. The gametes fuse and an offspring is produced from the fertilized egg. Therefore, the resulting offspring has a unique genetic structure. 
Happily, the bonnet head shark only reproduces asexually if females cannot find males. Otherwise, they will undergo sexual reproduction. Whee! Our next property involves information. Life is not static. It changes from moment to moment, and even a unicellular organism grows, divides, and develops. And the instructions to direct the development of a life form are written in molecules called DNA. This is also the molecule of heredity that is passed from one generation to the next. Development includes all the changes that take place during an organism's life. As you can see, this baby is not the same as a fertilized egg or a full-grown adult. All forms of life respond to stimuli, physical or chemical changes in their internal or external environment. This plant is exhibiting a response called phototropism. It needs photons from sunlight to produce sugar and will grow to face the sun in order to capture as much sunlight as possible. This Venus flytrap has trigger hairs. See the little spine right there? When the hairs are touched, the leaves fold together and trap the insect. Secretions containing digestive enzymes kill and digest the prey. Mmm, yum! The fourth property that all living organisms possess is the regulation of internal environments, or homeostasis. This jackrabbit has to maintain a certain internal temperature in order to sustain all the neat chemical reactions that keep the rabbit alive in the arid environment he lives in. But as the air temperature increases during the daytime, so does the rabbit's temperature. How does it keep from overheating? Well, look at the ears. Do you see the large arteries running through the ears? Let's look at them in more detail. The jackrabbit's large ears act as radiators, with the blood vessels right underneath thin skin. As warm blood flows to the ears, heat is released to the environment. The blood returning to the jackrabbit's heart is cooler and will lower its internal body temperature. But you might be thinking, what if the air temperature is higher than the rabbit's body temperature? Wouldn't the blood start absorbing heat? Good question. If the air temperature rises above 40 degrees Celsius, the vessels in the jackrabbit's ears constrict, or narrow, stopping the flow of blood to the ears. In the heat of the day, jackrabbits retreat to shrubby areas, where they dig shallow depressions, stretch out, and chillax. The next characteristic organisms possess to survive in a particular environment is called an adaptation. Adaptations are heritable, meaning that these characteristics are passed on from parents to offspring. Now I just have to say, this baby jackrabbit is adorable. It must be adapted to be adorable. Ooh, here's a question to see if you understand what you just learned. Now, don't click the box until you tell me your answer. We can look at life from different levels, from the atoms that make up parts of the cell to the earth as a whole. An atom is the smallest unit to retain chemical properties. Atoms are arranged into molecules. This water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. Cells, the basic units of life, are composed of molecules. Goblet cells, like this one, produce mucus to protect various organs, such as intestine. Tissues are associations of cells. Millions of cells form the tissue lining the small intestine. Now, organs perform certain functions for living organisms and are composed of tissues. The stomach, liver, intestines, and other organs are part of the digestive system. Multicellular organisms, such as this pronghorn, rely on their various organ systems to maintain homeostasis and keep them alive. A group of organisms that are the same species is a population. Organisms capable of breeding with one another to produce viable offspring are in the same species. A collection of the different species that interact in a certain area is called a community. 
the pronghorn, insects, junipers, and grasses belong to this West Texas community. A community, plus the non-living components, such as water, minerals, soil, and climate, is an ecosystem. And last but not least, all living things on the planet make up the biosphere. Ooh, here's another question. The theory of evolution explains how populations, over time, have adapted to their changing environment. Although many scientists and non-scientists propose that life was not static throughout the years, it wasn't until the 19th century that Charles Darwin proposed a mechanism to scientifically explain how evolution could occur. Darwin made many observations that led to this realization of the process of evolution. The first, all populations contain variation on a genetic level. The second, offspring inherit characteristics from their parents. And the third, organisms with the most appropriate characteristics for their environment will leave the most offspring. This is the mechanism of natural selection. Let's look at an example of how this might occur. On an island, we have a mouse population that has obvious variation in fur color, light gray, medium gray, and dark gray. Fur color for the mouse is a heritable characteristic. As light parents produce offspring with light gray fur, medium parents produce medium gray offspring, and dark parents produce dark offspring. On their island home, there is a somewhat active volcano, but it has not erupted in quite a while. They scurry across light-colored sand, looking for seeds to eat. And while the mice have no land predators, they do have some aerial predators. Oh dear. That prey upon the mice they can see the best against the light sand. Which would be the mice with the darker fur, right? So the dark-furred mice are selected against in this type of environment. The lighter mice survive longer and produce more offspring as a result. The mice with light fur are better adapted to the environment with light sand. But what if the environment changed, as all environments do? Oh no! The volcano is erupting and spewing hot lava everywhere! Oh, that was awful. What a horrible tragedy. Most of the mice did not survive, as they were not adapted for searing hot lava. But a few climbed trees and came back down to a very different environment. The lava that covered the island cooled to a dark-colored rock. Which mice can the predators more easily see now? Right, the mice with light fur. So which mice are better adapted to their new environment? Right, the mice with darker fur. The environment has changed so that the dark-furred mice have the best adaptation. Populations evolve as a result of selective pressure from changes in their environment. Natural selection acts on individuals by favoring those that have traits that allow them to survive and reproduce. This leads us to our next question. Why are there so many different kinds of organisms? As we discussed earlier, evolution is the change a population of organisms experiences from one generation to the next. This figure of a branching tree looks somewhat similar to a family tree. However, this tree can show us how the process of evolution can produce so many species. Since this tree also shows how organisms are evolutionarily related to one another, we call it a phylogenetic tree. Hmm, weird word. We call it this name because the phylogeny of an organism is its evolutionary history. As we move up the tree, we are moving from the past into the present. But let's go back in time, back to at least 3.8 billion years ago. Fossil evidence indicates unicellular life evolved around this time. And as time went by, some members in this population experienced changes in its genetic material, which we call mutations. Some of these changes were so great that different species evolved, as shown by the branching in our tree. As you can see, new species arose again and again throughout time. 
Now the tips of the branches represent recent species or groups of related organisms. Here are the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Organisms in the domains bacteria and archaea are composed of prokaryotic cells, while eukarya contains organisms composed of, you guessed it, eukaryotic cells. So you might think archaea and bacteria are more closely related to one another because they're composed of the same cell type. But is that true? Hmm. Another question. Yay! Phylogenetic trees can be represented in different ways and contain more detail, such as this one that shows major groups within the three different domains. So, how do we figure out these groups represented by phylogenetic trees? First, let's learn a little more about those domains we just talked about. All life on the planet can be placed into one of the three domains. Each of the rod-shaped structures in this photo is a bacterial cell. The domain bacteria contains the most diverse array of prokaryotes. Bacteria are found everywhere, from the icy depths of the ocean to near boiling hot springs, from the surface of your skin to the depths of your intestines. A few cause diseases, but most are essential for the rest of life to survive. The prokaryotes known as archaea live alongside bacteria, in boiling hot springs and intestine. However, Archaea are very different in one characteristic. Only a few pathogenic archaea have been found. This photo shows a colony composed of many cells. And last but not least, eukarya. Other than bacteria and archaea, all other organisms are composed of eukaryotic cells. So all plants, like this ivy, fungi, like this mushroom, animals, like this frog, and protists, like this paramecium, are in the domain eukarya. Organisms in each of the domains are grouped into various taxa, based on their similarities. Let's look at an example. Let's go from the most general taxon, the domain, to the most specific taxon, the species. Dogs are composed of eukaryotic cells and are placed in the domain eukarya. But what comes next? Well, the other taxa in increasing order of specificity, meaning getting more specific, are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Dogs are also animals, so are placed in the kingdom Animalia. They are also in the phylum Chordata, because their main nerve cord runs down their back. They are in the class Mammalia, because the females have mammary glands. And they are in the order Carnivora, because they are carnivores. They are in the family Canidae, because they are canids. They are in the genus Canis, which contains wolves and coyotes. They are specifically Canis lupus, because they are technically wolves. But they are a special subspecies of wolf, Canis lupus familiaris. The science of grouping organisms into taxa, which is the plural of taxon, is called taxonomy. Now, let's look a little more closely at that species name. Like all of science, we have to be very careful when classifying. While we commonly call this little guy a black bear, there are black bears in the Americas and Asia. So that every scientist knows what species we are talking about, we refer to this guy as Ursus americanus. There can be no confusion if we do that. But what does Ursus americanus actually mean? It is composed of the genus and a specific epithet, Let's look at an example for our species. This is the scientific name for our species, Homo sapiens. Homo is the genus, while sapiens is the specific epithet. Homo is the Latin word for man, while the specific epithet means wise. If we just used Homo, we would be specifying a human of which there have been many throughout evolutionary history but pairing it with sapiens tells us we mean a very specific human, the species Homo sapiens, us. Now, scientific names must be written in a certain way, 
so we know it is a species and not just some random Latin words. If we are typing it, we must italicize both the genus and the specific epithet. If we are writing it, we must underline both. The genus must be capitalized, while the specific epithet is not capitalized. And they must be paired. If you just write sapiens, then this is just a Latin word that means wise. You must pair it with its genus to indicate which species you're discussing. I know this seems picky, but we try to be exact in science. And here's your last question for this video.